following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. So our lecture today is entitled, Our Dreamlike Nature of Existence. It's a very uh, interesting thing to think about. Uh, Maybe some of us have been learning or reading or understanding topics such as this. The fact that the nature of our mind or the nature of our consciousness is sleeping. But... It's one thing to see that as a theory and then something else to really work with facts, something that's practical. And there was probably a time in which we were unaware or there was a time when we first came across this idea or this notion that we are, as a mind or a consciousness, sleeping and that there's something to be done with our state of consciousness. There's a very interesting and somewhat famous story in Buddhism of a a Brahmin uh, walking up to the Buddha and the Brahmin was very curious who this person was because he was obviously someone of great stature, someone very wise. And he asked the Buddha a series of questions trying to figure out what exactly this person was. And he asked uh, the Buddha if you know, he was a god, and the Buddha kept saying no. And he said, well, are you a human? No. Are you some type of demigod, some type of diva? And the Buddha kept saying no, no. Are you some type of trickster spirit or elemental? And the Buddha said no. And then finally the Brahmin gave up and said, well, what exactly are you? And the Buddha gave a bit of an elaborate answer. And then at the end, the Buddha simply said, I am awake. I am awakened. And this really points something out. The word Buddha is actually a title meaning the awakened one. So the state of a Buddha is is a state of being awake. And it's our aspiration to emulate that, to achieve that, to achieve Buddhahood. Uh, So what that would imply is that we're not awake, that we must be asleep. So being that, how do we know that we're asleep? Because it's interesting that it may be a theory, it may be uh, either an attractive theory or it may be a um, kind of an unattractive theory in our mind. It's something that we don't really like to think um, that we're asleep, if you ask in a very naive way, you know, what, if someone is awake or asleep, they usually tell you that, well, I think I'm more or less awake from a very kind of just practical day-to-day standpoint. Their body is awake, they're experiencing things, so they think, well, yeah, I'm more or less awake. I don't know. I, it takes some elaboration and some testing to see what is really the, tr- the state of our mind? What is really going on here? 
how do we know? How do we know that we're sleeping? How do we know that our, our mind is asleep? How can we put something factual to this? How can we observe that fact? Well, that's something that we have to test. It's something that we can observe. This is why it's important for us to begin to pay attention to what's going on day to day, practically, in our life. Somebody who is awake never dreams. An awakened person never dreams. So what does that mean? What does that mean an awakened person never dreams? We think that dreaming happens when our body's asleep. And this is true. We have dreams when we go to sleep. But our state of mind uh, really shows that we're sleeping during the day as well. A simple way to observe that fact is to simply retrospect and see if we can recall all the specific events or details of our, of our day, of yesterday. To go a little bit further, perhaps, and ask ourselves, what were all the events of last week? And maybe even last month. And if you do that exercise, you'll see very quickly that our memory is very valuable. It's, very, it's full of many gaps and holes. We know the further we go back, the more hazy and foggy it becomes. It's more difficult to discern one day from the next. It's very difficult to really, from one month to the next, actually discern what week something happened the previous month. Just to put it an event, not even to the day, just the week it happened or the day of the week it happened. So that shows you our state of mind. We, that's the state of mind of, of all of us. We're all more or less in that condition. But it's not the ultimate nature of mind. It's not the root nature of our mind. There's something else going on there. And that's why any teacher, such as Buddha or any avatar, is really teaching. In Buddhism, it's very clear, more uh, elucidated. In other teachings, you hear about waking up or the, some story where a person wakes up and they're waking up to the facts. They're waking up to the state of affairs as it actually is, as opposed to some state of affairs as it appears to be, some projection. So a dream in and of itself is some perception, but it's not the actual state of affairs. There's some relationship there. So something can happen and there can be some type of dream or fascination in relationship to that. Uh, Samuel Unveor writes in Fundamental Education, it is very difficult for people to recognize that they are asleep since the entire world believes themselves to be awake. Nevertheless, if someone was to recognize that his consciousness is asleep, it is obvious that he would begin to awaken from that very moment. So, a very simple way, uh, if you're ever having a conversation with someone and we're talking, and talking about these matters, it's, it's often the case where a person doesn't really understand that. But if you ever had the phenomenon of not knowing where you put something. Where did you put your keys? And now you can't find, you, you don't know where you put them, so you're searching for them. Or when you put something in a special location so you don't forget where it is, and then you forget where that special location was, so that you didn't forget it. So what, what is the point there? Because somebody put those keys somewhere, and that somebody was us. So by what right or what, by what means do we have to not remember it? Why don't we remember that? Shouldn't that be the natural state of our mind, of our consciousness, to remember the things it actually does? It would seem, from a certain perspective, that should be our state. So when we observe, we get the actual data of our life, of when we forget something, or we make a mistake, or we have a conversation and we forget the point that we're trying to make, 
or we are in the middle of one thing, get distracted and never complete the original task. These are all very practical data points that will say, yes, our mind is asleep. There's something going on here. So this is not something that we should just digest uh, intellectually and theoretically that, hey, we're asleep and we need to awaken. In the beginning, that's the first step intellectually to kind of see that. But you, as an individual person, must get the data. You must observe the facts. You must work in a practical way. So it's not something that you accept or reject. It's something that you know. And that in, its, in and of itself is, is Gnostic. It is Gnosis, that, that practical daily life. If we were to step a little bit further and maybe elaborate on why or how is it that we are falling asleep, what are some of the key points that we can pull out of? Why is it that we are falling asleep? Why is it that it's difficult to pay attention? If we begin to practice paying attention, being aware, we'll find that it's difficult. Again, that's something that we can know for ourselves. We should become very curious as to why we are not constantly paying attention. We need to come, become very curious about that fact. We live here physically, and the easiest place to have your consciousness, in a certain sense, to begin awakening your consciousness, the easiest place to start is here in the physical body. It's the most practical. This is the most dense form of impressions that we get, so it's the thing that we can work with the most, the easiest. There's other levels of mind. You can awaken in a dream, but it's unlikely if you're ever going to awaken outside of your physical body, if you've never had your consciousness present inside your physical body, because the physical body works with very dense types of energy, much easier to deal with that. When you're outside of your body, your consciousness is working with something much more fluid and subtle, much more fascinating in a certain sense. So it's much easier to fall asleep. So if you want to awaken outside your physical body, you start here and now in the physical body. So let's take a very concrete, practical example of how this process can work. We'll work with something that physically can bring our consciousness into sleep. It could be any object, any merchandise. We're, very, we're very, uh, a culture of, of much merchandise and, and uh, consumerism, right? particularly in the West, but now it's pretty much global, this consumeristic type of society. If you think of something new that's very desirable, it could be a new smartphone, a new car, some new clothing, new, new pair of shoes, you know, a new pair of sneakers, a new pair of nice shoes, uh, if we were just to look at those shoes, there's some attraction that we have towards it, if you're that type of person. Some people don't care about shoes, another person might care about the iPhone. But whatever it is, if we just choose the shoes, there's something about our quality of being, our quality of mind, that's attracting ourselves to that pair and not to another pair, right? You might first say, well, the shoes look nice. And that's what's attracting me to it. And why this is important is because if we're paying attention, if we are present within ourselves, and we have a sensation, we become attracted to that sensation. And that's how we jump or we go from an attentive sense of ourself to becoming lost into some impression. There's something going on there. The very basic level is that, is that really raw sensation. It, uh, it can be pleasant or unpleasant. You know, a sense of like clothing or apparel could just feel nice, could be nice. So you could have that kind of just nice sensation. We're attracted towards nice sensations. We would like, you know, a, a blanket that's nice and soft and warm. We would like a shower that's a little bit warmer or a pool that's a little bit cooler, whatever it is. We want something nice. And we get attracted towards pleasant sensations versus unpleasant sensations. That's obvious, right? So some clothing could have that type of attraction towards it. But there's more than that, because sometimes we'll buy some clothing that's very uncomfortable. So it's not just some raw sensation there. We could buy a pair of shoes that's really 
terrible to wear. We hate, we, it doesn't feel nice at all. But we buy it anyway. There's some, other, there's some other attraction towards it. So it's not simply some raw sensation. There's something else going on. And it has something to do with what that material item brings to us. What does it do to ourselves? It's not that the attraction is in this external object itself. It's actually, it's in ourselves. It's the relationship between our state of mind, what's going on in our mind, with what that external object represents to us. It's more about the idea than the actual matter. So it's not so much that the shoe is nice to, to, to that it feels nice, it's about what that shoe represents. It's not about, it's not just about the phone itself, it's about what that phone represents. And it's what we want to, for example, project. If we have a certain type of fascination within ourselves of what we want ourselves to be, we can project that in a material sense. So the external world mingles with something about ourselves, and then that produces a fascination. And the quality of the fascination is more to do with our emotions and ideas. It's just the external world kind of pushes the buttons that we have to put us to sleep. It's, it's really important to kind of observe that, to see that relationship, how it works. Because the next level of looking at this analysis is getting rid of the external world. Because the mind kind of runs a, a, a upon its own self-sustaining machinery, we can say, to use an analogy, right? That's, that's the samsaric cycle. It is self-perpetuating. It perpetuates itself. The mind perpetuates itself. The, the activity of the mind seems to perpetuate itself that one fascinating element which animates some type of thought or feeling produces some other attraction to some other element and you see how the chain of causation occurs within our own mind one thing causing another thing so the dream is perpetuating itself so if we take advantage of the practical day if we really pay attention to how the external world is influencing our internal world, how we can see the internal reactions, if we're doing that on a daily basis, when we sit down to meditate, we'll be a thousand times more prepared and we'll be a thousand times more uh, impactful. Because when you sit to meditate, all you're doing is sh kind of shutting down and withdrawing from those external senses and you're left with just that internal process. So there is something else going on here, of course, because I, I spoke about the true nature of our mind, and then we have this sleeping nature. If we are asleep and, and we can actually even observe some of this activity of the mind or the consciousness getting pulled in different ways, what is it that's actually observing it? What, what is it there that can actually see this going on? Perceive it. And in these studies, we call that the essence. In Buddhism, they call that the Tathagata Garbha, or the, the uh, Buddha nature, or Buddha seed. Some very kind of seed element. And that very element contains some very some root properties to it that can be helpful for us to to understand to even meditate upon because it's those very root elements that give a rise to all of our perceptions everything that we experience so the first aspect of the Tathagata Garbha, our Buddha nature, our essence, is that it is essentially empty. 
That's a very difficult concept that it's either empty or void. This is something that requires a lot of contemplation and meditation. All three of these uh, aspects that we're going to talk about require a lot of meditation. Particularly when we, in other lectures, are talking about the being and all these wonderful, magnificent archetypes of the being or different parts of the being. All the different symbolism that's going on. And it gives us a, an idea of a very rich and colorful, multidimensional existence of a being. And all of that is absolutely true. But that being emerges from where? It emerges from the absolute. It emerges from the abstract space, from the void, from the emptiness. So all of those beautiful manifestations, all those beautiful parts of the being, have a thread back to the absolute. In fact, all those beautiful parts of the being in the final synthesis are to be completely integrated, 100%. And it's when it becomes completely integrated that it, that it goes back into the absolute, some other process. So we need to understand both the form and the emptiness of the being. But at the very, very root, root nature, we say that the, if you try to dive into the depths of the being, you always find something deeper. You get to the depths of the being and you find emptiness. But not just emptiness as darkness, but as uh, luminous, which is the second quality. Not emptiness as a black room, but emptiness as a luminous or illuminated void. Right? We, there are many quotes from Samuel Unveyor that talks about the illuminated void. And he writes, It is necessary to know, to experience in a living way, the illuminated aspect of the consciousness. It is urgent to feel and experience the void aspect of the mind. So although it seems, it can seem to our intellect when we talk about this tathagata garba, or essence, or root nature of our being, to be empty, we really have to qualify that and really understand that in a very deep sense. That type of, of wisdom, of comprehension of the emptiness, will help safeguard us against projections of our ego, or help safeguard our, our mythomania from having experiences. We have an experience out of the body, and it's very beautiful, and it could be even objective. But if we take that and grasp it as real, as a real essential nature of ourself, we develop an ego related to it. We say all the time that the being has no form. And yet, if I say the being is essentially empty, you may have a different response in your mind. It's the same, it's the same thing. The being has no form. It is essentially empty. So our, our root nature of consciousness, our root nature of being, whenever you try to look into it, there's always some kind of deeper sense to it. It goes all the way to the absolute. But it's also luminous. By this word luminous, we don't mean like a simple type of light. What we mean is that it has the capacity to see, has the capacity to perceive. And then, not only is it empty and have a capacity to see, there's a third aspect that we call unimpeded activity or spontaneous activity, which means that the being has the ability to act, and it acts spontaneously according to its own nature. What we experience from moment to moment is a very obstructed, impeded activity. We have very little willpower. We have very little freedom to actually do, to actually do anything. We are 
restricted in all of our actions. Physically, we have some restrictions related to kind of the laws of, the, of physics and everything. But mentally, we're, we're even more restricted. Anytime that we have a negative emotion, why isn't that we can't not have it anymore? It's because we don't have that unimpeded activity to be free. We are under the will of our own ego, of our own karma. So if you look at those three root natures, the essentially empty, luminous, and spontaneous root nature of ourself, everything else kind of unfolds from that. So you can have an experience related to your being, and it could be shown to you in various forms and various symbols. And it's, your being could even, or you can have an experience related to other people. But is your being that actual person, or is it just a symbol? Even if your Divine Mother appeared to you as a beautiful woman, is that actually your Divine Mother? No, it's just a form, it's just a symbol. It would disappear into the emptiness. We grasp at those images because we have a very poor understanding of the empty nature of our own self. When I say self, I mean being, really. We have a very poor understanding of emptiness. But it is not by some accident that Buddhism very heavily speaks about the emptiness repeatedly because it's so powerful. It's extremely powerful to comprehend that, to experience it. Those three root natures of our mind or consciousness or being, we can say, in Buddhism they usually just say the root nature of mind, but in our tradition we'll either call that the being or the consciousness or the essence, depending on how you want to phrase it. But those three natures are related to the three fundamental properties or laws that we often speak about. The holy number three. We speak of uh, you know, the supernal triangle in Kabbalah, which is Keter, Hokmah, and Binah, which we know is related to the Holy Trinity or the Trimurti. In Buddhism, it's related to what's called the Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nirmanakaya. It's the same principle. So what we're saying here is that the root nature of our own being is the Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nirmanakaya. And that the root nature of the Dharmakaya aspect is, again, the emptiness, an infinite potential. So why is emptiness related to infinite potential? As soon as you put form to something, you limit that, that thing. Any form is a limitation. If you express something in a form, it's limited by that form. So something that has no form has infinite potential to go into any form. So dharmakaya, as a, just a property, is described as an absolute formless level of experience. Its nirvanic quality, we can say, is emptiness or infinite potential. Its samsaric quality is a fundamental type of ignorance. The second, the second quality, the sambhogakaya, is going, instead of an absolute formless level of experience, it's a pure form of experience. There's some form there, but it's this very pure and abstract. That's related to the luminosity, or just the root capacity to perceive or see. But in its samsara quality, it manifests as dualistic perception. So the second aspect is related to the second logos, which is Hokumah, which is what uh, Samael Unveor states is where the most beautiful atoms of Christ reside, is in that second aspect. And that most beautiful aspect is where that luminosity is. The luminosity of Christ, the glory of Christ, that, that's where that luminosity is. 
and that's where the perfect multiple unity is. But in its opposite aspect, instead of a perfect multiple unity, you have the most imperfect du duplicity or dualistic perception. Instead of everything being all as one and a perfect harmony, we see the complete opposite of that. We see myself and everybody else is different than me. Then finally, the nirmanakaya is the impermanent form related to uh, Bina, the Holy Spirit, which we know is related most heavily with the world of formation in, in Kabbalah. So you can make various types of analyses there. So it is the impermanent form. It is that, it is that actual kind of expression. And as we said before, it's nirvana quality is the unimpeded expression as awareness, or the actual cognition in action. So one thing is the capacity to see. The other thing is actually <coughs> seeing. One is the capacity, one is the actual activity of it. So that's why it's that unimpeded activity of that cognition. It's samsara quality is, yeah, is taking that, but now it's instead of the perfect forms of action, it's confused expression. So when our being emerges from the absolute, it holds these three fundamental properties. And it's from those three fundamental properties that everything elaborates, right? But a monad or a being that has not achieved mastery co-originates both the nirvana quality and the samsara quality at the same time. There's, a, there's an aspect of it which is have emptiness and infinite potential, but there's another aspect of it that has a fundamental ignorance to it. Otherwise, why do we have to do a work? Why do we have to work on ourselves? Why do we have to achieve initiation? Why do we have to awaken if there's not something to be done? There's some kind of transformation that's going on, not just from our sense here physically, but related to our being as well. So not only is there that type of infinite potential, but it co-originates with something which is ignorant, which seems very contradictory to our mind. But it must be in some sense that way, otherwise there'd be no work to do. And then again, you have that perfect capacity of cognition, and then you have the opposite co-originating factor of dualistic perception. So as and then the, the third being the unimpeded expression is also co-originating with confused expression. So as our essence descends into the matter and is placed into this physical world and various types of bodies, you see a co-emergence of both of these factors. But it's not until we get into our, human, our humanoid existence with an intellect that we really begin to uh, exhibit much more of the samsara quality. We really begin to make a mess out of things and have a very confused state of mind. So let's take these factors and put, a, put some logic to it and see how one leads to the next leads to the next. Our fundamental ignorance of the essential emptiness of our, of our own nature leads us to see that luminosity, even though the luminosity is a part of our root, our root nature, that luminosity is perceived through a dualistic sense. So the first aspect is truly we have this emptiness, which is our own being, purely abstract. But because we falsely perceive it as a real self, that's, uh, we perceive ourselves in a way that's not actually real. And it's usually myself and someone else as something different. So we have this root sense that's ignorant, that I exist substantially and in and of myself without any other factors. I just exist independently. That's what we believe. It's not the truth, though. We don't just believe it consciously. It's very deeply embedded in our mind. 
that it just reflexively views the world that way. Me and other. We have that reflex. So as soon as we perceive something, the luminosity, instead of being a luminous understanding of that emptiness, it gets turned on its side, and now it's, I'm perceiving myself and everything else as something separate. So one always leads to the other. Without deeply recognizing the emptiness, you always reflexively take that luminosity and transform it into dualistic perception. So I wrote it out as erroneously cognizing luminosity as something other than self. The luminosity is of our own nature, but we see it as the other thing. It's like when a dog views its own image in a mirror and thinks it's some, another dog. Our luminosity, we see things and we view it as something substantially real outside of ourself. So we, we set up a dualistic framework of self and other through that misapprehension. And that nature, we see it, we see it as two separate things. But that's not the way the things actually are. That's a confused state of perception. It's ignorance. And because we don't actually perceive reality in the way that it actually is, that leads to the final state. Instead of a spontaneous experience that's in perfect harmony, we have emotional reactions or confused reactions of this falsely separate self and this falsely separate other towards, you know, the falsely, se the falsely separate self acting against that falsely perceived other. So if you put it all together, it, it reads out as, our fundamental ignorance of essential emptiness of self leads to erroneously cognizing luminosity as other than self, which results in a dualistic framework of self and other, which leads to the unimpeded awareness to be expressed as emotional reactions from that subject towards the object. That all seems very intellectual, and it is. But there's a very beautiful and important knowledge behind that, information behind that, that you can recognize in your own experience through meditation. That level of ignorance is so deep that we can't get to it through the intellect. We can read this and maybe parse it out intellectually and see, okay, I can see how one can lead to the other. But again, we have this deep reflexive way of experiencing the world that's totally unconscious to ourselves. It's deeply unconscious. So that process of awakening is taking what little, what little bit of free luminosity that we have, a little bit of light that we do have, and shining it into the darkness, into the ignorance, and seeing what part of ourselves is acting in some way which is not in accord with the actual reality of our, of our world. And that reminds us of the light shining in the darkness and the darkness understanding it not. Our inner darkness doesn't actually understand how this world works. I don't just mean this physical world, but I mean the whole universe, all of samsara and nirvana. So we talked about a few things. Firstly, that in our practical life, we fall into fascination. That there's a relationship between our senses in this physical world and our states of mind and our state of emotion and even instincts and physical activity. That because we have a certain state of mind, we become lost, we, we fall asleep. Secondly, that there is some root nature of our mind which has an innate capacity to see when it's liberated, when it's free. But our nature of self, our, nat our, our being, is not real in the sense that it's 
some super 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 defined like like old man in the clouds that our, our divine mother the image of our divine mother is only a symbol the root nature of that is the emptiness that void A final aspect, because the, the first aspect is that we're sleeping. The second aspect is that our own being is, has this empty nature to it. And the third aspect is that even the physical world that we have really doesn't have a, a substantially real independent nature either. That even all the objects that we see perceptually in a very normal sense, we view it as real, and in any pragmatic sense it is, because we deal with it, but you can dive into the nature of any of these physical objects and you will find that none of them have substantial reality either. So neither does our, ex our external reality doesn't have a substantial nature to it and our internal reality doesn't have a substantial nature to it either. And the external and the internal are really the same thing as well. You talk about us being in samsara and the person who's achieving liberation or awakening is, is getting out of samsara, achieving nirvana, right? But the reality is that the only difference between nirvana and samsara is the state of mind. Nirvana, or the superior worlds, is simply the perception which is unconfused and not bound by karma. And samsara is confused perception that is also bound by karma. So if we pur purify our perception and we liberate or we exhaust all of our karma, karmic debts, then samsara becomes nirvana. So what does that really mean? Because we can look at that practically when we get out of our physical body, whether it's through dreaming unconsciously or we have an experience related to meditation or dream yoga. We have to understand that you could be out of your body and still be in a nirvanic, or I'm sorry, in a samsaric type of quality of mind. Just because you're out of your physical body doesn't mean you, you have pure perception. You could be out of your physical body and still have confused perception. In fact, that's what our dreams are. It gets a little bit more confusing when we wake up to some partial extent and we're still viewing something, some, some perception. That's how our experiences can become misapprehended and taken over by our ego, and we can fall into errors in that way. Uh, so if we were to look at how to, how to break how to kind of decompose this physical existence as also having no substantial nature, we could first, again, just look at anything physical, like this table here. We say, well, the table exists, right? The table has some source, some thing in and of itself, and then we see the table. This is how we naively view everything in the world. The chair exists, and I see the chair. And we imagine that, well, there's some, that chair exists without me seeing it, and then I see it. That there's some source of that knowledge, that thing in and of itself, that, you know? Um, but none of these physical things can exist in and of, them, in and of themselves. They only exist as they are, they, they seem like something because of the way we perceive it. We have a three-dimensional perception, so we see it in three dimensions. If we had a different type of perceptions, if we could see it fourth dimensionally, we would see it differently. And likewise, fifth and sixth and seventh dimension. So the form of any object is always just a relationship between the type of perceptions that we have and how that form manifests. There is no root form of anything. Because my same quality of mind that I'm seeing now 
is, doesn't exist in any distance from any of the other dimensions. We think of the absolute as like some very far away place. But all the dimensions are right here. So any form or any quality that we have, it's not like the quality exists and then it gets implanted into ourself. The quality of something is some, some type of information and our perceptions coming together and that coming together produces the quality. So then we take, um, so that, that's just a way of looking at how nothing physically independently exists. Secondly, the sensation itself arrives, and in this sense, uh, we can have the sensation of seeing a coiled rope. You can imagine it's a coiled rope. Well, that, in, these, this information arrives from the, the world and travels through space and time and enters into our perceptions, and we get all the raw information that represents that coiled rope. Instantaneously, that, that raw sensation gets combined with our mind. And our mind, like, instantaneously, reflexively, attaches it to whatever concepts or previous egos that have been implanted there. And immediately takes that sensation and makes a perception out of it. So you have the raw sensation plus our previous concepts, you get some result there. So you can, there, there's a very, uh, in all the Buddhist teachings, there's a, like a, an analogy that's often explained that you can, let's say you, you imagine opening up a, a kind of a dark closet and seeing that coiled rope, but the way the light is, it looks like a snake. And that's what that, that image is kind of a, an image there of a, a rope that looks like a snake. But it's actually a rope. It's actually one thing. We perceive it as something else. Now, in a physical sense, well, okay, yeah, we have that immediate reaction and we reflexively maybe get scared or there's something going on. In reality, it never was a snake, but we reacted to it as if it was a snake. And based on that reaction, that can create actually an ego. That can create some formation crystallizing in our mind. Now, the image of the snake and the rope is something very simple to understand, but in reality, we are constantly perceiving the world and taking in the world in a way that doesn't actually correspond to the reality of it. That's all we're doing, constantly, one step after another, constantly seeing the world and receiving the world and impressing that world upon our mind in a way that doesn't actually correspond to reality. And when you start to think, well, why do I keep making mistakes in life? Why is it that I'm striving for something and I just can't seem to get it? It's because we are continuously making the wrong, we're seeing the world in the wrong way, and we're basing ourselves off of misperceptions. So, in, so really, this physical world, we think of this physical world to be kind of real, because we can touch it and sense it. But if you break apart the whole process of the, the sensation and the, the uh, perception and the impression, you break it all apart, well, where's the reality of it? Because one thing is just the raw sensory information, and then another thing is the perception, which is just our old habits, our old mind, reflexively responding to it, and then we get this final impression. So where, when you t take all that out, where do you find, where do you hit bedrock? Where's the actual reality? How do you get to the actual reality? Where is it? Again, reflexively throughout the day, we just take it all in, like it's really there. It's really how, that whatever we appear to be observing is really real. So it's one thing to be dreaming and asleep, another thing to wake up and actually observe the world. That's good. But then we start observing the world. If we observe this whole world as just substantially real, the way we just naively bring it all in through our senses, it's not going to be that helpful. We have to be on guard. We have to be very watchful that we are just observing this world and it's appearing in a certain way, but it may have nothing to do with reality. It doesn't mean that we should just reject our senses. Just we have to comprehend them. 
just have to go deeper. We can't naively just accept everything. Really, that's the subtle difference between observing, this, observing the world and actually being awake. Because you can observe and, and pay attention and really kind of be present and record the information, but it's something else to really be awake, to really remember your being. And that's why in Buddhism they often say you should see the world as a dreamlike experience. That this physical world you should treat with dreamlike qualities. That this world has dreamlike qualities. It's not to say that nothing matters. Things matter. There's karma. If I bang my head against the wall, I'll feel pain. If I make a mistake, I'll have to pay for that mistake. But everything about it is very much dreamlike. There is no bedrock. It doesn't exist. Every, if you, if it, anytime you dig deeper, you find nothing more than smoke. And it just fades away. You go deeper, you find nothing more. Everything only exists in a relationship. The very fact to get information, how do you get information? It travels from one thing that emits the information, and then you have to, and then something else has to receive it. So information is always a representation between two things. There is no information in and of itself. It doesn't make sense. You have to receive information from somewhere else. So it's always a, there's always something there. It's, it's never the root information. It's always the nature of the way it's expressed and the nature of the way it's received. And there's no way to get at in between what's going on there. This is the limitation of having forms. In the absolute, it's all integrated. It's one thing. It's something inexpressible. Because it can't be expressed as information. Because information implies duplicity and different forms. That's why it says here, uh, nothing can be known in and of itself because things can only exist relationally. That means they only exist in relationship to other things. Right? Anything that you show me, I can relate it to something else. Whether it's that chair is related to that chair by some spatial difference. Or some quality that you can relate. So things only exist relationally. And all information is always transactional. It always goes from a source to a destination. All of these things imply, all these things imply that something has, you know, there's, there's a relational and transactional aspect to everything that we experience. That's why it's a dreamlike quality. It approximates some kind of reality. And it's very um, repeatable and testable. You know, I can, I can do science because the laws are repeatable. But ultimately, you get down again to this insubstantial nature. It doesn't exist upon itself. So it's, important, it's, very, it's very helpful for us to view this world as like, almost as if it was a dream. And it's, and it's, it's helpful to, to also view the dream as if it has more reality. Because when we're in the dream world, we accept very crazy things happening. Reflexively, unconsciously, we just accept them happening. Like really weird, strange stuff. It doesn't, we know that those things can't happen. When we come back to our physical body, we know it can't happen. So why did I just reflexively just accept that that happened? You know, it's very strange. In the dream, you're, you're in, in the middle of the woods, you're climbing up a path, and it's very difficult, and there's people shooting arrows at you or something. You wake up and say, that was a really strange dream. Why did I just accept all that? We weren't, we weren't awake, but we accepted it as almost as this dream. If we saw it as like, well, this can't really be happening. It's not the nature. We have to kind of bring together the physical perceptions and realities that we accept and what we accept in the dream world and kind of put, bring them closer together because it's one continuum. So just, I have two quotes at the end here. One is from the uh, Hevadra Tantra and it says that forms, sounds, and more of samsara, feelings and more of samsara, sense organs of samsara, anger and other emotions of samsara, are all phenomena of nirvana. 
Through confusion, samsara takes form. Without confusion and with purification of samsara, samsara is transformed into nirvana. So the more that we can integrate our understanding of this physical reality and our internal experiences of being of a continuum related to our state of mind, the more we can directly, more we can progress without misapprehending those inner experiences. If we view this world as being non-spiritual and far away from our being and innermost, and then we view anything that's in our dream world or out-of-body experiences as being super substantially real and direct and true, we're going to fall into mistakes because our ego still exists in those other dimensions. And our ego definitely exists in the physical dimension when we're thinking about it. Right? The God is here and right now, and the ego can also exist out of our body. Our confused state of perception can be here or it can be out of our body. A purer state of perception can be here or out of the body. And then finally, the Buddha states, my dreamlike form appeared to dreamlike beings to show them the dreamlike path that leads to dreamlike enlightenment. Do you have any questions? So, uh, Blavatsky in the Secret Doctrine talks about that there are different characteristics of matter. She says, you know, uh, what we perceive as direct length, length width, and height. Really, there's, there's only one, it's just extension. It's just one characteristic of matter, just as, you know, color is another. She says they're, they're related to the sense. So, if we haven't developed a particular sense, then we can't perceive that characteristic of matter. And she says that the next, the next perception that we will, we will come to is what she calls permeability. That's the state of matter, permeability, and it corresponds to natural clairvoyance. And then she also says in order to develop that, instead of waiting for evolution, but to actually develop natural clairvoyance, we have to meditate. So how does that relate to what you were talking about, that continuum of consciousness and that, um, you know, how is that sort of related to it? Mm -hmm. So we have our perceptions, or we have our sense organs, and we have some nature of, of the world, and we only perceive in relationship to how our sense organs are developed. Well, the chakras are our superior senses, specifically the upper chakras related to clairvoyance and polyvoyance and telepathy and the ability to intuitively understand things. Um, Samael and Vior says that we need to develop our spatial sense. And this is what he's speaking about. And when, this is what Blavatsky is also speaking about. Uh, when he's, uh, Samael and Vior also writes that, you know, if you could, when we see an object, we only see it in terms of lines and shapes. But if we had a developed spatial sense, we'd be able to see that thing from its top and its bottom and from its outside and from its inside and from its future and it's from its past kind of all integrated. It's very difficult for us to kind of imagine what that might be, but it's related to uh, an intuition into, f into seeing something, seeing kind of that root nature, getting closer to it. Uh, through meditation, we're withdrawing the senses, our senses of seeing and hearing and the touch sense, and we are developing our inner senses. We're working with those inner senses, and when that movement of energy and through you know, developing the capacity to keep attention, you start to move that energy and you start to awaken those chakras. Of course, fundamentally developing those chakras through transmutation, through creating the solar bodies, those are all going to inflame or enlighten those senses even more. So meditation develops our inner senses, basically. And we bring those inner senses back to our physicality, but it, it develops very gradually. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question at all? Sure. So, to put it another way, it's, so when she talks about permeability of matter, she's really talking about permeability from a consciousness standpoint. It's, it's really utilizing, it's not, it's 
not that two objects are permeable to each other. It's, it's that it, our state of consciousness changes the nature of that matter to our perceptions. To our perceptions, right. I, I don't, I haven't studied exactly what Blavatsky stated, but we can say definitely that <coughs> when our senses develop and change, the form of the things we see change. And it's not because the, the form is changing, it's because the relationship between the source of that knowledge and the receptor of that knowledge is changing. So we're getting something different. So as our senses change, we see the world in a different way. So Ryan, um, if you viewed it, what, what you were pointing at was all, everything was illusion, right? And ego is obviously illusion. So why is so much, like why is it enough Yes. Right. So compre so con Right. Yeah, so comprehension through meditation, we are co coming into our internal senses. And you can either think of it as elevating your consciousness or going deeper into the subconsciousness with attention. You know, it's that, that combination. Meditation Obviously, it's, it's very sophisticated, but those states of mind that we get ourselves into, where we have one part that's very attentive and another part that's not attentive, and one part is seeing the other part, and it's a very, it's a very, at face value, it just seems like meditation. When you try to put it to words, it's almost indescribable how you're going to be attentive and inattentive at the same time, and it's both yourself. In fact, you have to merge the two. If you separate the two, you, you run into a, an obstacle. We develop that comprehension, yeah, by going deeper. It can't be just the intellect. And even, Samuel says, even the word comprehension becomes a label. And it becomes a limiting factor if we just kind of use the word comprehension in a very flat way. We're using the word comprehension because we have to use something, but it's, it's extremely deep. He says that we need an emotional significance behind it as well. What exactly is it? How do you pinpoint that? When do you know you've achieved it? It's, it's very difficult because you try to put your finger on it and you distort it. Or you try to grasp at it and it's the ego thinking it's achieved something. So it's, it's, there's pitfalls. But. Uh, you also said um, that everything exists in relation to something else. Nothing, essentially, nothing exists in and of itself. But Buddha, the Buddha says, Right. You know, nirvana is in relation to samsara, and karma is in relation to cause and effect. So what makes those three things eternal and different? My, my understanding of space, karma, and nirvana is that they are the root causes of everything that exists. But when everything gets swallowed up into the absolute, even those get swallowed up as well. That at the end of the cosmic day, causality and karma and everything gets suspended, you know, because karma is going away because it's going into the absolute and nothing is being played out anymore. So it's not there anymore. It's gone. But anything that exists is going to be predicated in some space, whatever, whatever space that is, it's going to have that cause and effect. And nirvana and samsara are the same exact thing. It's just, samsara is just another extension from nirvana. So whenever we say nirvana, if you're in a confused state of mind, you're in samsara. If you're in an unconfused state of mind and you have no karma, then you're in nirvana. So when something, when you come into existence, those are the kind of those three root factors. But my understanding is those get swallowed up in the absolute at the end of the day. From that perspective, yeah. And that's why it's this dreamlike enlightenment.
It's very, I mean, that quote, I like that quote because we're always talking about to awaken, to awaken, to awaken. But the tantras always talk about this world being dreamlike and to view even nirvana as dreamlike because even in nirvana, having perfect perception of some transcendent being, that, be, that, that being is still, is still interdependent. It's still just an, it's still a, um, it's still emerging from the void and returning to the void. Someone else have a question? <laughs> um, my question is, when doing the key of soul, um, you know, subject, object, location, isn't that kind of intrinsically, you know, having that dualistic mind and aspect that my, my essence is the subject and whatever I'm observing is the object? Um, so then, what, how do we confront that reality and what is the relationship? with the key of soul and just being and mm -hmm. noticing that without thinking. Yeah, it's a good question. Because you're right, when you do the subject-object location, you're dividing your attention. It's a division of attention. But it's the same reason why to awaken, we really need to start here in this, in this place of many different forms, this physical world. We kind of have to pull ourselves up from the bootstraps and get as concrete as we can sometimes and then later remove the scaffolding. You know, it's like you build up that scaffolding, but you don't need it at the end. Samuel says that the way he practiced SOL is completely integrated. It gets completely integrated into the instinctual center. So instead of the reflexive type of me versus the self, it's a reflexive you and me, we are one. If you want true compassion, how could you possibly see someone as, as other? True compassion is complete. I mean, true ultimate compassion, the true ultimate bodhisattva, sees both the dualistic nature and the fact that they're one simultaneously and treats the other person exactly or better as they, as they would treat themselves. But anyway, yeah, the SOL, in the beginning, it really is a division of attention. But we need something to kind of grasp onto to get a hold of this because otherwise it's like we're, we're kind of, uh, we need like the, we're in this huge ocean and being swallowed up by waves and we just need the, the swimmies and the life vest on just so we can float above the water for a little bit until we know how to swim. Uh, so it's good to start there, subject to object location, but then as you, you get a little more accustomed to that, you just integrate it and, and go with the flow, kind of go with that, f that mind stream of seeing everything all at once. Does that make sense? That you would be able to understand the source of some, of some manifestation of lust. If you really got down to it. So for example, Sam Allen Vior writes about, he was working on, a, I think he was working on lust, and he has an, a very difficult time, and he went out of his body, had this experience in front of the tribunals, and they thrust a, a spear into him, and this horse-like element left from him related to lust. You might have an experience like that where there's an ego that's very particularly related to a certain previous life or a certain type of a set of experiences. But if you were to go deeper and say, well, why did, I keep fall, why did I originally fall into that? Why did I originally start falling into this stuff? And it's related to those three root natures. That there's a, there's a, when an essence is brand new, it has this fundamental naivete and ignorance about how things really are. So... Lust is really at the very core of that, the very root nature of it. So you would find some experiences that would relate to that, but then you have that kind of fundamental level of just that root lust. Very difficult to comprehend. So not just lust, I'm just saying like any defect. Any, def so any defect, yeah. Would you be able to like tell somebody like, well, my anger started in this lifetime because this, this happened and then that now whenever this happens to me, my anger comes up and I comprehend all of that. Is it 
if you reach if you reach a certain level, you would have that type of knowledge. But you probably you would need to be a very competent investigator of the internal worlds to know exactly when parts of your ego developed. You not only have to be able to get out of your physical body, but you have to be very competent and be like a scientist outside of your body to investigate that type of thing. Yeah, because people just talk, we talk a lot about comprehension, but we never really, like, no one, I've never heard anyone actually, like, talk about comprehension that they have. <laughs> <laughs> you can have, my understanding of comprehension, it always comes in levels. So we need a level that, that will work, that will help us out here and now. So it would be something more like, like something Jungian, because it's basically, I remember my past, and it happened to me, and it's just related to that. It could be. I mean, it can come up in a thousand different ways. Realize, too, that you can reach all the initiations of major mysteries and still have a tremendous amount of ego. You really don't start really, really, you know, killing all the infidels and all, and all of our egos until we're completely developed as a human being. Then we have the ability to cut all the heads off. A thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand, you know? Um... And then when you're at that level, you're working with very deep into your ego. So we can do all this. We think we're doing a tremendous amount of work on our ego. We are in a relative sense. But when we reach those initiations, we're going so much deeper. So much deeper. That's probably that level of comprehension that you're talking about. So we can think it's going to be like yoga now that we work a lot on this ego. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you could reach 50% of the elimination of your ego without achieving a single initiation. So that's a tremendous amount. If we achieved that level, we'd be in paradise. That would be enough to really change the whole course of the situation of this world. It just doesn't seem to be in the cards. <laughs> doesn't seem to, to, to be what's going to happen. Yeah. My other question was, you mentioned how if we were awake, we would remember every event that ever happened to us. And um, there's some people who can do that. But that doesn't really mean they're awake, right? They just have something that's different about their brain that they can just remember. Like you said to them, what happened on February 4th, 1962, they can remember every detail of that day. But right. kind of like you were saying, it's, it's even deeper than just remembering everything. It's more like an intuitive understanding of, of how they could actually exist. Right, and that's a good point because you're right. There are some people who have that type of memory that's extremely detailed. Aren't they just remember everything doesn't mean they're awake, actually. It's deeper than that. You guys in the retrospective exercise, um, that while it's important to, you know, go back and remember every detail, I, if, if I remember correctly, there's something about uh, that the point of exercise is not a memory exercise, per se. It's more about identifying those moments where you were identified with the ego and being able to eliminate it. So, when I practice a retrospective exercise, part of it is psychological laziness, where I'm like, I don't have to like remember everything, <laughs> I just need to jump to that. So I'm kind of confused about, <laughs> about that. So in the retrospective exercise, yeah, the point of it is not to just develop your memory. It'd be much more helpful is that as you're retrospecting, that the, the gaps of your memory may have the, the keys that we need to change. Because you think about it, our most egotistical moments are going to be the moments that are we're most asleep. And we're the moments that we make the kind of the biggest mistakes. Even if they're little ones, they're still the bigger ones that we're making throughout the day. You know, the way we treat someone, the way that we respond to a certain way, the way that we uh, have a little bit of pride or arrogance or anger, whatever it is. So those are the moments we're going to be the most asleep. So there's always a, a big correlation between those gaps and us acting in a way that's going to cause us to suffer in the future and other people to suffer. So we don't necessarily just want to just, oh, I, I now remembered everything, I'm done. That wouldn't actually help us that much. If you're doing a retrospective exercise and something really, like you, you find that you found something, it could be five minutes into that retrospective exercise where, oh, I remember that. Oh, I, and I acted that way. And, and you, you begin to see something like, there's something about the way I acted there. You could abandon the retrospective exercise right there and just go right into that. Because you found something, might as well work on it. There might have been 20 other things, but you know what? Let's just go over the, the so-called low-hanging fruit. I got this one. Let me dissect this. You don't need to, like, you know, oh, I'll worry about that one but later. I'm such a good meditator. I'm going to find the really, really deep one. Like, take whatever is in front of you.
To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.